English Dad, please? I'm just going to try to be very fastidious here. There's no doubt that heart surgery changed me. And we just review what we're going to do in a second. Okay, it so defined me. I'm going to put my lower cable tape in the anterograde cardioplegia, then we'll arrest, okay? The last thoughts that I had as I was being wheeled into the operating room were, what's your legacy? What footprints have you left in the sands of time for your, your daughters to follow in? And I didn't have any answers. I'll take a knife and a tonsil and a CO2 line. The fact that I did not know what that was, that was the most powerful moment of my life. You think of who may be coming in to see a cardiologist, and here comes in some guy in his young 30s who's fit, who's fairly healthy, who's out running triathlons. They don't typically see patients like me. Well, when I met Dave, he was pretty much just a, he was a big football player. He was, he was huge. He was your, your stereotypical football player. Um, and, you know, running was certainly not something that he did or wanted to do. And I was pretty into it at the time. So he started running and kind of caught the bug um, and started doing some different triathlon races, some short stuff, and he was falling in love with the sport. And um, that's when he started to have these heart symptoms. Up until that point, he was functioning fine. they discovered I had a congenital heart defect called a bicuspid aortic valve. I can truthfully say it was the last thing I would ever expect because he had been so active all his life. When I found out that he was going to have to have the surgery, I was really worried, but I was trying to stay strong, but inside I was really worried. When I found out I had to have surgery, I refused to say, all right, let's get it booked right away. I had to take care of business. And I don't mean my job. I meant get my life insurance in order and get my will in order. It was a dark time, and it wasn't a good place to go into surgery without those answers. Not. He's never told us like it was near death, but like we all kind of knew. Like it was really serious and we were younger, so like we don't really remember it that much, but like we've seen pictures and we we know it was it was close. To never really think about it. I try not to. That would have been really hard if he'd passed. It would have changed everything. This was the first time in his life where he felt vulnerable. And I think it was the first time in his life where he, he realized I'm not in control here. This is truly out of my control. I had to do a really quick check on my life. And yeah, my life flashed before my eyes. And when it did, I saw 
all these great moments that I've had over the years, but it still couldn't answer the question to me of what's my legacy? And if I die today, what messages have I left for my kids to lead their lives by? I came out of surgery and I was in ICU and it was, uh, it was like right out of the movies. I didn't really know what was happening, but I know everything went bad really quick. You could hear the codes being called overhead and you could hear people just rushing in the room. With Carrie watching, I went into what's called ventricular fibrillation. Your heart doesn't have a functional beat. All doctors to 305, to 305. I was very, very scared. I mean, it was, it was a horrible, horrible time for me. Dave was in his early 30s, strong as an ox. But suddenly, Carrie and his mom and I and his brother were standing around yelling, fight, fight, fight. They went five minutes without getting a functional heartbeat back. Dr. Salerno made the call to bring Carrie in and have her say any last words to me before they wheeled me back into the operating room. I pictured the possibility of losing him, and I just, uh, I, I couldn't accept it. I just went over and I whispered, you better fight. You know, you gotta fight, because you are not leaving me now. I need you. And um, then it was just waiting. After 14 hours of surgery, I woke up Finally, realized that I was alive and about to start on the long journey back to hell. When he uh, got through it and started talking about doing an Iron Man, I thought, is he crazy or what? A Mill Creek dad is taking on an incredible physical challenge the Ironman competition. That might not seem newsworthy until you learn he's had open heart surgery and a stroke. Who knows what his thinking was? I think Ironman was that distraction he needed to get through, I think, the demons of truly what happened. An Ironman is the longest form of a triathlon. A triathlon is a swim, bike, and run, and an Ironman comprises a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike, and then we finish it off with a little minor task of a marathon, so 26.2 miles of running. This is definitely the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I come from Olympic distance and I was pretty successful down in that distance. I was a world champion in that distance. 
Um, I didn't think it would, you know, get a whole lot harder than that to achieve a great result until I started Ironman. <laughs> Then I discovered a whole new triathlon that I never knew really existed. It's a challenge mentally, physically, emotionally. You, you go in places that you never thought you would go. There are going to be times when body and mind are, are telling you to stop and you have to override those and you have to have faith in your body and in your mind to, to overcome those challenges. Everyone wants to quit. They want to quit badly and they don't. And that, I believe, is, is a powerful metaphor for life. Ironman is about getting to that finish line and celebrating life. You know, us professionals, we do it for a living, we love racing, but that's no different to, you know, the average Joe, so to speak, that comes out here. They want to complete the Ironman. It's not necessarily for everyone about winning, it's about completing the race. The first Ironman took place on the island of Oahu in 1978. It was the result of a challenge that a number of active duty military personnel had, which was to determine who were the, the toughest and best athletes. Was it swimmers, cyclists, or runners? Tinley goes through this aid station as if it were a car wash. He's moving now. It wasn't a race. It was a personal challenge. And the fundamental values of Ironman really haven't changed. There's fast people, there's slow people, but ultimately it, it's a personal challenge. Julie is only 10 yards from victory, but her legs won't carry her any longer. She falls to her knees and slumps to the pavement as Kathleen, who can't see her in the confusion, breaks the ribbon. But what has happened? Who won? Kathleen asks. You did, she's told. Julie? Well, Julie Moss will finish this race. She's come too far to stop now. The first Iron Man was 13 months after heart surgery. He did finish his first, but it was after time. And I started calling everybody I knew back at the finish line, like, do not let them close that finish. He's making it. They called his name, you know, David Watkins. <laughs> I can't even say it, because that makes me cry. Um, but it was awesome. They let him finish. It was very, very cool. And, he finished, yay, so I'm like, yes, I get my husband back. And, uh, but you yeah, know, of course, he went on to do a couple more Ironman races. So what time did you get up? Um, like 9.30. Good, are you ready? Yeah. You gonna kick some butt? Yeah. Yeah. Ironman was such a big event. And then it was, I'm back to my life, now what? You're right. Uh, we had this conversation three months ago and I was stressed and it turned out okay. After and surgery, we were able to rally. I was an angry guy. I don't know what I was angry at. I was angry at the world, at being a cardiac patient. And when I came out of surgery, they told me that they had to replace my aorta with a pig valve. There are two different types of valves we can use to replace somebody's heart valve. One is um, what we call a bioprosthetic valve or a tissue valve and they're made out of some kind of biological tissue. So either a cadaveric valve from a human um, or a valve made of pig or cow or something along those lines. The plus side of them is they don't require any blood thinners at all to prevent clot formation. 
The downside of those valves is they have a relatively limited lifespan. Guess what it's time for today? Nastiness. Knowing that I have to have it done again, I've got this window of time to figure out my legacy question. So after surgery, I went on this, this quest to see if there was anybody else out there like me competing in events, running, cycling, triathlons, that, that had, had faced their own issues through heart surgery or through whatever heart complications they had, but had chose to get back to a life of being really active and maybe active to an extreme. So I just started searching and I found these people doing these amazing things all over the world after overcoming huge adversity. My name is Ellen Chanley. I have a congenital heart defect and I did the Arizona Ironman 2010. That was a hard year. My name is Ryan Leong. I've done four Ironmans. I've done a number of marathons, and probably seven, eight times. Having been born with a defect, I guess you had problems all your life, but because you live with it, you don't really know that. Yeah, when I was diagnosed, I was 37 years old. I was at a practice triathlon, and then all of a sudden, I started coughing, and uh, I kept coughing, and I was coughing up blood. I never really experienced any known symptoms until relatively recently. Sometimes at the end of a four or five hour bike ride, I'd, I'd be completely blind in my right eye. When I was younger, you know, I would have irregular heartbeats. I didn't know anyone else didn't have that. After the diagnosis, I had extensive heart tests. I went through every heart test you can imagine. It was uh, quite a process to go through. And I think ultimately only those that have gone through heart surgery know what that process is like. Initially, I thought, they must have it wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. I am a triathlete, and I'm invincible. Heart disease takes a significant toll. Depression is not uncommon. Denial is not uncommon. A lot of change associated with heart disease. It was a shock. I remember staring at myself in the mirror, looking at my chest, thinking, how the hell are you going to go in there? Wow. Oh, I remember this. <laughs> that was the bed that you slept on. I met with a whole slew of doctors and different specialists from different areas, and they found nothing wrong with my eye or my brain. But one doctor listened to my heart, and she detected a heart murmur. When I was getting ready to call Ellen to break the news to her about the major congenital heart defect, I knew this was going to have major uh, impact on her quality of life, her activities, how she defines herself, and I also knew there were probably major procedures ahead for her in the future. Amy, what is that we're seeing there? So this is your intraatrial septum here. And this is the one that was repaired, right? Yes. Yeah. They thought there was maybe three, possibly four holes in the heart. But when the surgery had finished, he came out and talked to my husband, and he said that uh, it was Swiss cheese, um, i.e. it was so holy, they, they, they lost count of the holes, and the, the wall was, uh, they had to rip, cut out the whole wall and, and build a new wall within the heart. The only way to make that not prolapse is to massively pour short in about half. No, I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I just remember being in shock, as I think most people would, when you consider yourself to be healthy and then somebody tells you you have to have a major surgery. It was a humbling experience to have to be so dependent on somebody at that age where the day before I was doing whatever I needed to do and had complete control of that. 
After I had surgery, I was ready for the fact that I could have a mechanical valve. And I knew that that meant I'd be on Coumadin the rest of my life, but it meant that I was alive. I remember thinking being in the ICU would be like it is on Grey's Anatomy or the ER, paddles everywhere. paddles everywhere and glass doors everywhere. I mean, I had months and months of support from people like Dave who had basically taken the time to say, hey, you know what, it's gonna be all right. You're gonna get through this and your life is gonna be better for it. And that's something that I would have never said before I went through this, that my life is better now that I went through this. Who did your surgery? Mahalovic. My father had him too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. The problem with congenital heart defects is that it takes somebody who is willing to dig around into your history and do these extra things to find it. Yeah, and father knows held my hand, actually. Yeah? So she, I was really You do a lot scared. of holding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. If I didn't have a doctor that fought for me on that one, chances are I would have died. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad everything turned out well. Yeah. <laughs> it's overwhelming, I know. It's okay. Oh, okay, that's good. Stop filming that. My perspective changed, there's no question. I realized that living was clearly the most important thing, and for once my type A personality took a back seat, and I thought, you know what, I, I gotta take one step at a time. My doctors, my husband, my family probably would have had a cardiac arrest if they'd have thought I was thinking of an Iron Man at that point. Pulling the, the team together was about connecting like-minded individuals that had gone through some pretty nasty stuff. Hey! And I wanted to identify some very unique individuals from across the country that we could maybe pull in together for one race. Is that be Patrick? If we can inspire others that have issues with their heart, to realize that there are so many things out there that you still can do, and you can live life to the absolute maximum. Right, so we're doing a uh, double file? Then that's what this is all about. All right, here we go, buddy. All right, nice and easy, nice and easy. Iron Man's one example of how, if you truly dedicate yourself to something, I believe anything is possible and the relationships that develop through that process, that's what life should be about. So it's the morning of Ironman Arizona. We are here filming the beginning of the next year of our lives. And most importantly, we're here supporting Jim Oldfield right now. I am Jim Oldfield. This is my fifth Ironman attempt. So I'm almost like I'm in a perpetual Rocky One movie, you know. It just, it sometimes feels that way. Doing another Ironman, I only wanted to take that challenge on again if it was about something more than just myself. Ironheart Racing Team doing an Ironman together is about spreading the word, is about telling the world that we are able to do this. Scott, what's your feeling? It's awesome, I mean, it's uh, Ironman, you're motivated seeing all these people, so. I can't wait till next year. I'm really looking forward to this. We've got people that have done Iron Man before. One who's done it many times. Oh man, that was a tough day. We've got one who's never even, didn't even know what an Iron Man really was until just a couple of weeks ago. Dave convinced me to do this. I'm out here seeing it right now, and it's ridiculous. It's completely overwhelming right now.
And then we've got another person who's attempted five times and has yet to make it to the finish line. Dude, you are a rock star. How you feeling? You kicked ass out there. It is heartbreaking when he doesn't cross that finish line. Woo! But I know that we will try again, and he will succeed. So any athletes that haven't made the, the cutoff, we'll stop them here and make sure that they're all taken care of, you know, physically so that the emotional recovery can start in the days and weeks and months ahead. I'm not worried about his health in trying to attempt to do another Ironman. I just support him. And I, I know that he'll eventually accomplish it. And hallelujah, that's going to be a really good day. How's that for you? I just hate to be a weenie around. You are not a weenie, man. You're just out there doing Ironman, brother. I've signed up for next year. I'll be back. I'll never quit. Good morning everyone, here we are in uh, lining up, or queuing as I would say. You have to get in line to do this, there's so many mad people in the world who want to do this. And we're a group of them. Here we go, here we go. This has now become about something much larger than any of us as individuals. We're now trying to inspire people. I wanted to take on another challenge to prove that nothing is impossible. Everybody can do it. If they have a heart and the willpower to do it, they can do it. Thank you. Congratulations. Cool. Yeah, I'll see you next year. Absolutely. Yeah. Iron Man's, you know, you have to pay attention to yourself, your training, your diet, your need, your rest. It was a good year. <laughs> this one's a little different. It feels a little different to me because this one's, you know, not as much for me as it is for helping to tell the story to hopefully inspire, encourage people, um, whether they're heart athletes or non-cardiac athletes, to go out there and challenge those boundaries. Hey mom, it's Adam. Ironheart Racing is, to me, it's a community of people that I have never had access to before. It's people who understand me, it's people who you just feel supported. All right, everybody ready? And ultimately I'm gonna attempt Ironman because they are the ones who are, are pushing me to do this. It's my credit card and my license. I'm gonna do it. Guys, there's no turning back now. <laughs> I'm a little worried about it because the teammates that uh, I'm training with for one year have all done an Ironman before. And uh, I have never done a race longer than a 5K. Yeah, it's a um, 2.4 mile swim and then, a, mm -hmm, and then a 112 mile bike ride. <laughs> And then after that, a uh, marathon. And you have to do it in 17 hours. Mom. <laughs> Iron Man is a lot of things. And one thing that it really is, is unpredictable. As much as we train and prepare, you have to prepare and plan for the unexpected as well. This is it. We're all in. Let's do a Go Ironheart Racing on three. One, two, three. Go, go Ironheart Iron Racing! Do I know if everybody's going to make it? Do I want to say, watch this show and watch everybody make it? No. Because you don't know. Dude is my little doggy. We rescued him from a shelter in Vegas. And um, he's surprisingly eight years old, even though he acts as if he's a puppy still and looks like he's a puppy. He's the love of my life and he knows when I'm not feeling well and after surgery, he was by my side all the time. 
Yeah. Alan had surgery in March 2010 and it was very British stiff upper lip mm -hmm. stuff. It was, right, we're going to do this surgery, we're going to recover and we'll get back to normal as quickly as possible. Um, that's kind of how I dealt with it. Morning. I started to get slowly back into training. I started to swim again, I started to run again, and started to bike again. Each day you get stronger and the body has an amazing way of recovering. But the emotional recovery seemed to take longer for me and parts of me are still dealing with it. You know, major heart surgery is daunting enough, but to meet that trauma head-on and then tackle a monumental athletic endeavor is almost a superhuman feat. Fox 8 sports anchor John Telich has the story of a woman who beat all odds. Well, I had the Ironman already signed up for eight months later, and uh, my doctors were thinking I was nuts. 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike, and 26-mile marathon. Ellen, she reached out to me right after she had had surgery. And I just had this admiration for somebody who took on the Iron Man in such a short period of time after surgery. We're really gonna go and swim out that. Dave is all about making people feel better. He's, he's a terrific mentor, he's a, he's a great friend and he and I have become inseparable. All right, you know what, you can dinker all you want. I'm just kidding. Dave has brought us all together, and he's got his cardiac limitations too. Wow. Come on, you. So we actually really don't know what will happen, because we don't know if we're gonna to get to that finish line. We really don't. We're here at University of Washington for that echo uh, to get the blessing of Dr. Stout. I'm a little bit nervous, no doubt. These appointments are always a reminder that I'm not an, just an athlete, but I'm a cardiac patient as well. All right. I feel good. I don't have symptoms, but you don't need to have symptoms to have a potential problem with your heart. This is part of my kind of every six month checkup. We get an echo, and, and then I'll sit down and meet with Dr. Stout. How was the blood pressure? It was great, 129 over 62. The main thing now is that I'm starting to near that window of when my pig valve that I have is starting to wear thin. Pretty hard. There's that delicate balance of you've got to be fit and healthy to prolong your heart. And Iron Man is kind of an extreme. I mean, it is an extreme. And I think you can be certainly healthy and happy and wonderful, toning it way down. But that's not how he's built. And it worries me that his heart has some issues. Are you thinking about racing? Right now? Yeah. Actually, I was thinking about racing. Because your heart rate just went up. Did it? <laughs> Like 10 beats. Dave, Ellen, and Adam have been incredibly thoughtful through the entire process about balancing risks and benefits. And all three of them will absolutely quit doing what they're doing if we think that the risk outweighs their perceived benefit. But all of these things are always one individual's perspective on what's important to them in their life. I'm actually looking at the muscle walls of your heart now. You get measurements on those? Correct. If a patient has heart disease and they're thinking about doing something as extreme as an Ironman, it's really important that they be checked out by someone who really understands their heart problem and can really educate them in the risks of doing that. Okay. All right. So they need to know if they are at risk of sudden death during this event. Um, let's exercise you and make sure there's nothing hiding there and then we will certainly reconvene as time goes along. Sudden cardiac death is anybody who dies suddenly from a heart-related reason, which is almost always an abnormal heart rhythm in some form. 
there will be some people whose heart disease will look at and say, even if you could complete it, I think it's a bad idea that you try. So right. Ultimately, the decision is up to me, and, and, and I get that, and it's up to us, and I get that, and, and we'll, we'll make that decision and, um, and you know, live, hopefully live with it. Iron Man's about and filling gaps. Man, we'll I refused it. to allow myself to be identified as just a cardiac patient, as somebody who was sick. Refused to. I needed an identity, something that was not this scar in my chest. All right, but until then, I'm good to start back on a pretty decent exercise. See routine. how you're feeling. Okay. I don't think he's being reckless. I think he's being very careful. And I think he encourages that with the other cardiac patients that, that are doing this also. Okay, so good news. All's clear. Bring on Iron Man. Kai Beach, always voted one of the most beautiful beaches in the world by Traveler Magazine, everything else. So my heart right now, I try not to think about it too much, but um, my heart surgery, you know, was fairly simple as heart surgeries go. You know, they still had to open me up, go in there and do some work in there, but um, I had a complication. Ryan has got, I would say, a pretty rare, unique, and scary situation. His pericardium, the protective sac to his heart, has calcified onto his heart, creating what's called a stone heart. Construction is mild right now, but it will progress. It's just inevitable that it will progress. If uh, the constriction becomes too much that it really starts to affect the way my heart beats, they said essentially they need to go in there and peel the pericardium away like an orange, just the skin of an orange. Just literally open it up and pull it apart. Unfortunately, the doctors that I've talked to, they just said that there's a high mortality rate in that and they're not sure how, you know, there's not a lot of studies done on it. Ryan races because if he doesn't race and train, his particular rare heart condition could get worse. literally is racing for his life. It's one of those ones I can't control, so I just do the best I can, and hopefully it's just something that I can hold off for as long as I can. And. Uh, it sounds very cliche, but to live life to the fullest. How do you feel? Huh? A little chilly. It's all good. Ryan has done at least four or five Ironmans. So he's pretty competent, pretty capable, and pretty athletic. And um, he'll be able to provide a lot of guidance to our rookie, Adam. It's always a lot more fun when you're in shape. When I was about four years old, I had open heart surgery in California. There was just a really small section of my aorta that it just didn't grow. The rest of my body grew, but it was too narrow, so blood couldn't get through. I recovered great, and I had a very active youth, 
really pretty normal after recovering. I don't even remember the surgery. I mean, I was only four years old. It wasn't until college when the doctor said, look, you're good, we fixed this problem, but you need to know you have another issue. You have a, a, a bicuspid aortic valve that is leaky. It, it regurgitates, it's insufficient, all the same thing. So I went in six months later and he was like, we need to act because the walls of your heart are weakening so much. If you don't get this fixed, you'll need a heart transplant. That surgery was, it was incredibly challenging. It was one of the hardest times in my life. I thought, I I've done this before. I've had heart surgeries before, but I'd never had my chest sawed open. He was my first opportunity to mentor somebody who was going through what I had gone through already. And I think I had this bond with Adam because of that. How'd they go, Adam? Good, we're following racers in a car. We're filming racers out of the car. And when Ellen and I first started talking about, hey, let's go and do Iron Man again, Adam was one of the first people that popped into my head. Not only because he was a guy who could be behind the camera and film this, but because I, I see something in Adam, and I think a lot of people see something in Adam that he doesn't see in himself yet. This is, my, this is my new bike. It's very sexy. I never thought I would do an Ironman. Um, I had done running in high school. I tried a sprint triathlon. That's the shortest form of a triathlon. And now we're talking about doing the longest form of a triathlon with, without anything in between. So that's, it's really intimidating. It's as bad as you make it. I know, so it's kind of hard to tell. Like He doesn't like pain at all. Not really good for the sport that we're in because you endure a lot of it. But I still see this athlete inside of him and I see somebody who's much stronger than he thinks he is. How do you feel? Okay. I mean, I'm alive. The commitment and the sacrifice that's gonna go into this for him is like nothing that he's ever experienced before. Okay, so at 6 a.m. tomorrow, we're doing another workout. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have been told that I'll have the support I need to get through the training. And I'm, I'm hearing them, and I'm like, okay. But in my head, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Being successful at Ironman is just as much about getting to the starting line as it is about getting to the finish line. How to train, how to actually ride a bike. You think you know how to ride a bike? It's a different sport. Everyone that starts the process, they want to be an Ironman. They want to do what they think is impossible, what a lot of people think is impossible. Like, is it supposed to be excruciating? It, yeah, it probably is. It's supposed to be. Yeah. I always tell the athletes I coach, you have to have one thing out there with you when the going gets tough, because it's going to get tough. You think you know how to run? Well, I guarantee you Adam doesn't know how to run until he's already done the swim and the bike and has nothing left in his tank and then has to go and run. Everybody here is a crowd. We all walk around with a million faces. 
For me, it's about wanting to feel like I'm in control in my life. If I'm disciplined and I have goals for myself, it just makes everything else come into place. Outstanding. So here we are, Las Vegas, rock and roll. How you doing, man? Forty-four thousand people. A big part of, of doing a race like Iron Man is very selfish. All right, let's go. You're very consumed with yourself. That's tough on a lot of people. I just keep thinking to myself, this will pay off. This will pay off. Since my heart surgery, Donald and I have both taken a different outlook on life, and we strongly now believe, more so than ever, that we need to live each day as if it was your last, because it's going to be a last one for somebody all the time. A lot of Team Challenge runners coming in. Garrett finishing up for Team Challenge on the marathon. You're alive. Yeah. How'd it go? It's good. It's great. Perfect conditions. What do you feel like the, the thought that this is only a tiny portion of Iron Man? Yeah, that's a bit scary. The fact that this is only one half of the marathon. So prior to that, we have to swim and bike for a long time. So yeah, that's a bit scary. us in our last segment, we're all too aware that heart disease is a serious condition that affects both men and women, but it's also preventable through exercise and healthy eating habits. Joining me now is Dave Watkins, a heart disease survivor and the founder of Iron Heart Racing. And we I talk a lot publicly about the moment I was being wheeled into the operating room. Triathlete Dave Watkins remembers the moment about eight years ago when he nearly died after complications from heart surgery. I was five minutes without a heartbeat. When I was done with everything that I went through, all of the hiccups and the surgery, and almost not making it off of the operating table, I just made this decision that that's it. I'm going to start living my legacy right now. I think the thing that I'm struggling with most, though, is am I really doing what I set out to do? Let's eat. Now, when I'm home, I'm still not here. So, Maya, what's going on in school today? Um, so, I'm Maya, and my dad is Dave, and he's kind of crazy. <laughs> Let's go. He's doing his job, and he's doing the Ironheart job. Oh, boy. You're not going to have your eye fit on Iron Man. Sometimes it's a lot, but we still see him, and he's still there, so. Uh, oh, no. No. So, as you see your dad doing all this stuff, training for Iron Man, pushing himself like he does, I mean, what do you think it's about? I haven't thought of that before. I think we just want to 
challenge ourselves, like at school, get better grades, or at work, get paid more, do better at your job, or like in the Ironman, you just want to push yourself to do the best you can, be the best you can be. I don't know. I've never really thought about that. Why people do it? Yeah. I mean, most people probably have a reason, but I don't know what it is. I don't know. I think he's crazy. Everyone who does them, they're crazy. It is a kick to be able to say, you know, I, I train and I, and I race an Ironman, because it's, you know, it's an ego boost, obviously. You know, they say with heart patients especially, that after you've had your heart attack and your bypass surgery, within the first year, 90% of those patients go back to doing exactly what they did before. I've been changed for eight years. I knew that I was not doing well. Before the heart attack, I'm not exaggerating, I didn't walk a block. My dad used to kid around and say, you know, Jimmy, you have, you know, for breakfast you have, you know, a pot of coffee and a pack of cigarettes. That was, that was my life. I, I would have smoked more if I could have. I was in, really, I was in terrible shape. The last time I had weight, I was over 200. That's, that's... I honest to goodness thought the way I was going to clock out of this world was I was going to have a heart attack and then die. I, I truly felt that was how I was going to go. You know, I had my heart attack, but I didn't die. Now what do you do? You know, it's one of these things like, okay, now what? Come looking, hoping, praying for a miracle. He didn't have an athletic background at all. He was a workaholic, couch potato, he wouldn't even take a walk with me. We changed our lifestyle, we changed our habits, we changed what we ate, what we did. We changed a lot about our lifestyles and how we lived. I, I, just did, I just felt that different symptoms I had were not a big deal. You know, and other people after the heart attack said, you, you, you didn't look good. I was like, no. you know, you could have said something. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they would have listened. They would have tired of telling you. Yeah. They would have they told me I wouldn't pay attention. Yeah. It would have been nice. Yeah. we got to do a lot with Jim to help him to get to the finish line, mentally and physically. It's almost as if he doesn't allow his brain to take him to the finish line. It, it's frustrating for all of us, but I can't imagine what it feels like for him to be failing over and over and over again. I mean, only he can decide if he wants to really do it or not. When I cross the Ironman finish line, I probably won't see a lot of people. It's going to be tunnel vision. If I fail, I want to fail trying. I do not want to fail by not showing up, ever. When I race, I leave nothing. For him to finish Iron Man, this is a big part of our lives. This is it. I will support him no matter how many times it takes. That's me at the end of uh, the swarm of Iron Man 2007. What was I thinking? We had to tell him his Iron Man day can't continue. Not underneath the cutoff. But we know this young man is going to be an Iron Man one day. He's an Iron Man in our hearts. I had never been so exhausted in my entire life. I absolutely nothing left in me. I mean, with the coaching he's getting now and the people that are trying to direct him in the direction he needs to go with the nutrition, it's going to be very helpful for him.
It's cold, it's a little after six in the morning. Jim has brought us here to the track where his one of his coaches is showing us some running techniques. And you know it's actually after seven, because we're an hour ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't even know anymore. I'm going to the right. We are going to try very hard to keep him healthy, no injuries, and keep him focused on one race. We're not the ones too hard, just hard enough that you can feel that lean, okay? I can tell you that endurance sport is 95% metal. I swear. If Jim is going to get to the finish line, it's going to be because he's got his mind right. Part of Ironman is surrounding yourself with people that are going to support you and get you through it. Speed, not strength, so I want to go like this. Three. And I cannot do Ironman without the support of Carrie and the girls. I absolutely can't. But I've also found that I've got all these other people now that, in a lot of ways, I'm feeling responsible for. Hold your arms, David. Hold your arms, David. Come on, get those feet up now. Try to sight and then breathe. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just telling you the reality. You got 2,500 people, and if you stop and you're doing breaststroke, they're gonna go right over top of you. Probably a lot of the same type of questions. Okay. Phil, but first, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, why do you do this? Why, uh, why Ironman? Why triathlon? Yeah, I just, for me, I've been athletic my whole life, and it just continued to fuel my fire for athletics and pushing myself after swimming in college. I gained 40 pounds after I swam in college, and I wanted to get back in shape, so I started with the marathon and, and then uh, got really into triathlons living in Hawaii, and now I, I really just like the lifestyle and the people. It's really a fun, fun outlet for me. Take us a little bit through what has the recovery been like? Are you nervous for yourself? Actually, I, I'm not. I mean, it's I'm pretty at ease with, I've been doing triathlons for so long. I've probably done over 100 races. I've done three Ironmans. Uh, I've run 15 marathons. So for me, this day is, uh, is something that I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be a lot different Ironman for me because I'm out there to support other people and to inspire people that you can do what you want to do. I'm not going for a, a PR time. I'm just really going to try to truly enjoy the day and support uh, the people I coach. It seems like the emotions are still pretty raw. Yeah. Everything that's, that's gone on in the last year. Uh, I mean, is that is that how, kind of how you feel about it? It is. I, I feel like, um, you know, each day I feel fortunate because uh, You know, last year, sorry, That's all right. I didn't know if I'd ever do this again. So they said, you know, you, you should never do triathlon again. And so through that, I feel fortunate to be able to be out there again, you know, helping other people. The coaching has helped me so much to get back and have a positive outlook because uh, there's some dark times when you go through heart surgery and you don't know what's, what to expect. You don't know what's going to happen on the other side of that. Um, are you going to come through the heart surgery? And then beyond that, what's your life going to be like? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be different? So it is. It's still emotional for me because I feel so thankful, so blessed that I have this opportunity to do what I love to do still. And, and be around uh, my friends and, and be out training with other people. So, you know, I want my son to grow up knowing that you can do what you want to do. You know, don't put limitations on yourself. If you want to do something, you put your mind to it and, and you go out there and you do it. So, I, like I said, I feel very fortunate. It's like I feel like I have a second chance to do things I love to do and, and I'm going to take advantage of that.
So. I don't even know what to say anymore. I just found out that Scott Roy died. I'm not even sure if I believe it yet. I'm, first thing I did is got in the car and I'm going to Dave's house. I'm leaving work today to find out what's up, find out what happened. All Dave said is that he was on a 100 mile bike ride and now he's dead. for probably a few more hours and I don't know uh, yeah, I don't know if we're just being foolish you know I've got two young daughters to think about and I I can't even begin to comprehend what his wife and family are going through right now He's got a young boy. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I have the distinct pleasure to be here today and Team Blaze is well represented. And as we remember Scott, we want to celebrate the life that he shows. And that's a life that doesn't end with an earthly death. It just begins after that. And I want to quote Scott here for you. He said, ultimately, we all get one journey through life. And although at times it may not seem fair, or feel overwhelming, I truly believe that God has a plan for all of us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we gather today to remember and honor the memory of Scott.
I gotta be honest, I was a little more hilly than I thought when it got tough. I was just thinking of Scott, you know, and uh, enjoying the journey, and I think that helped. Um, running is always tough for me, and for the first time in a long time, I enjoyed it, and I had, uh, I had Scott on my shoulder, and um, I think that really made a difference. So I enjoyed the journey. Crazy. A lot of those are from when we lived in Hawaii, or before that. So, but, who's whose are those medals? Uh, Scott and I's medals. I think this row is Scott's up here, and this row is mine right here, and then this is I think both of our we. We started a new row because we <laughs> we ran out of room. Wow. So let's just, I want to start kind of more present. So you've done Ironman before, right? In uh, Coeur in 2004, Scott and I did it together. Now it looks like you're back. You're going to do it again. <laughs> How did that come about? And tell me about what that's going to mean to you. I don't know. I just felt compelled that if he couldn't do Arizona, that I should. I can, I mean, I could do it. And um, that would just be a great way to honor him um, and do it for him since he won't be able to do it. And um, to show other people that you have to keep going and moving on and that he wouldn't want anyone to quit because, I mean, he's coaching so many athletes. He was coaching so many athletes right now and I know a lot of people, um, you know, felt like they're not going to be able to do it. And I don't want anyone to think that. I want everyone to know that you can still do it and you just keep, you keep going because he wouldn't want anyone to quit. And no, no, Reese Roy, look at mom. It's that, it's that backpack right here, honey. I have to show people that you can keep going and I have to show that to Reese that, you know, mommy will, mommy will keep going and we will remember daddy by carrying on what he was doing. Liam's mom. Yeah. I don't think I've met Liam's mom. You know, Scott, you mention his name and I get emotional. This was a young guy, a lot like Dave. I just remember running and just crying and thinking of Tristan and her training and how strong and amazing she is. Hey Roy, good morning. Good. When did you start your official training? I mean, that's just so tragic and yeah, it worries me and that's why, yeah, I wanted Dave to be done with Iron Man. But I think sport also allows you to get rid of emotion. Could be why people do it. <laughs> well, and I've noticed lately that I go exercise and then I feel really, it makes me happy. Yeah. Like, I have this. Uh, you always have a better day after. I do, and I'm just happier. So Tristan now by default is a member of the Ironheart racing team and she's stepping in and gonna fill Scott's shoes there and wants to help coach our athletes and she's taking his spot for Arizona. 
It's incredible to me. I wouldn't be doing it. I, there's no way. question I've been more panicky so I put a lot of feelings down to anxiety but I've had this chest pain just working out well being no sedentary? no it's there all the time okay and then first one breathe normally breathe normally first one so I had a couple of tests at the University of Washington. I totally thought that this was going to be a routine test and a green light from her to say, yep, you're looking great, your heart is doing great. Can you see, is that blood movement you can see? Yes. It didn't kind of go like that. Breathe in, breathe out, hold it. Hey, how are you? Good, good. how are you? Yeah. You've got the whole crew. Hi. She walked into the room and said, so um, there's a major possibility that you won't race the Ironman because your heart's much bigger than it was last year. And I'm not sure why. So there is a phenomenon of an athlete's heart. Endurance athletes, their hearts get bigger. If you look at Lance Armstrong's heart, it's big. What we don't fucking know is if you have congenital heart disease, can you also get an athlete's heart? So the conversation was pretty dire, in fact. Not only was she giving me bad news about my heart's condition, possibly, but also the fact that there was now a huge question mark about racing the Ironman. This is one of those things. This won't be bad. I'm bummed, really bummed. You know, my gut tells me that I'm, I am fine, but to prove it, it's likely going to result in having to back off for three months significantly so we can decondition my heart, prove that it was for exercise, that the heart will shrink, and then hope that I still have enough base training to be able to do the Ironman. I left that office after about an hour conversation with her, completely crushed. All I knew was that the next few days were gonna be very tough as I waited to hear back from her. I'm here at University of Washington Medical Center. Two days ago on Wednesday, I had some tests and some things were a little funky. Hey, Dave. Hey, man. Here we are, months from Iron Man. Anything that's abnormal this close starts to freak me out. So what I was telling Adam is that there's sort of two pieces to this. The one is the overall heart health I'm not worried about. I want to understand this more. But over our heart health, he's totally stable since surgery. His valve is, certainly should be big enough for his body. He's obviously able to do well, no symptoms, is in good shape, otherwise young, healthy guy. I look at that and it's of curiosity to me, but it doesn't get me bent out of shape from a day-to-day -day life perspective and even from most physical activities perspective. But that extreme end of pushing oneself that is required for doing an Ironman that, I think, is a bad idea. I don't think, I think that that's, although the risk is still very small, the risk is higher than is probably, that I'm comfortable with, of something super ugly happening, specifically a sudden death event. With that extreme of exercise, and, and I'm being really specific about the Ironman, partly because you're signed up for one in November, and because... It's uh, 86 days away, by the way. And it's an extreme, <laughs> it's an extreme end yeah. of the spectrum. Right. This isn't, can I go do a 10K with Ironheart? I recommended Adam not run the Ironman because he had his valve replaced and his valve was functioning fine, but his heart muscle remained a bit thicker than um, normal. And even after the valve was fixed, it didn't go back down to normal the way we would expect. This is a different level of pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, eventually does have some sort of limit. And an Ironman is certainly a good way to find that. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, thank you for calculating my risk. Uh, yeah, something higher than I'm okay with, but not outrageously high. I still think that you could yeah. go out there and I don't know, 95% chance or higher that you would be fine during Iron Man, but any risk, any any risk that seems beyond the norm to me is not is not something you need it. you need to know about and then decide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just found out from Dr. Stout today after my appointment. She recommends against me doing the Iron Man. That came as a major shock. I've done so much training and it's hard to wrap your head around the idea that you're still a patient. I'll get some freaking food. I'm gonna die of starvation before I die of sudden cardiac arrest. <laughs> So wine's good. Wine is, is needed right now. Oh, and wine is good. Wine is good. So tell me what, I mean, God, what were you really thinking when she came in? I thought, oh my God, like, I just can't bear the thought of not doing anything for three months. But we've talked about this. It's not doing nothing. It's just doing different things. I know it's not triathlon things. Yoga. I know, yoga. There's a class tomorrow, I think I'll try. The thing that was most frustrating is that I actually thought that I was not a patient anymore. I actually thought that I was normal. I thought that my heart was fixed. I thought that the repair had been done and that I could go on my normal way, you know, training, racing, which I've been doing since surgery and not have a problem, but didn't she say, did you talk to her about that? And she said, um, I'm afraid to tell you you're always a patient or something like that. <laughs> yep, that's what she said. You will always be a patient. so much for agreeing to chat with me. I know you're super busy at this conference, but... Monday morning, I got a text from Dr. Stout, and her text said, my bike test and my exercise test and all my other tests are so great that they don't consider this enlarged heart to be anything other than an adaptation to exercise. It's 6.33 in the morning. I'm off to the pool. It's a good question why I do it. I think doing Ironman and training for an Ironman makes me feel like I don't have a cardiac problem, like my heart is fully functioning and that I can, I can do things that, that even able-bodied people can't do, even people with normal hearts can't do. And it sounds corny, but hopefully I can inspire other people to do it. It's not about completing Ironman, it's about getting off the couch and doing something to improve your your lifestyle and your health and that's that's really important Strong. That's good. Yeah. Good. Only uh, nine more weeks to go. Wow, that's kind of scary. It's going to be here before we know it. I know. Well, so are you feeling ready? Are you feeling good? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I feel ready, I think. It's hard though, because it was something that we did together and the club was such a big part of our life, which still is. I just, uh, now I think I need to have some other things that are part of my life. Um, 
I don't know what that means yet, but. Something yet to discover. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I still want triathlon to be a, I, it's like I was saying earlier, Ironman, it's like having this amazingly huge family. Yeah. And I mean, I'm an only child, so. Yeah, it's good to know that you're not alone. Yeah. We gotta go, we gotta move. I love you guys. Okay, let's do it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they pack a lot in here. Yeah. Alright guys, huddle up, huddle up. I just wanted to say, I love you all. You are my strength. Have a great day and uh, let's see each other at the finish line. Also, We're gonna go this way. Feeling good this morning. Ready to get started. Not too nervous. Just, uh, just ready, I guess. Yeah. What do we want to say to Daddy? Mommy will put some in the water too, okay? Maybe he wants it in the wind too. I think he likes it in the wind. You got everything you need in this bag. Yeah, I think so. You know, they say the journey is the reward. And I honestly, sincerely think that. Whether I finish 100 more Ironman or no Ironman, if you get to the starting line, you've already won because you've prepared yourself to get to that point. I'm really nervous. I've been to the porta party about three times. Haven't really been able to keep very much in me. So it's going to be a matter of just taking one step at a time, I think, today. Now I'm telling you, this is one of the best tricks that there is. When you're any race you do, have a brand new pair of goggles that's never been touched. As Debbie can tell you, I'm high maintenance. Yeah, you're very high maintenance. Usually it's the women that's high maintenance. I'm very low maintenance. He's the high maintenance one in the family. So, I should just hope he does well. <laughs> Having heart problems and continuing to have heart problems is one of these things where you know, it is a limiter, and for me, I try to forget about it. But this year, you know, with Scott passing, you know, it definitely hit home. So I'm just lubing everything up possible that could chafe. It's just one of those things you can control. Good luck today. And I was at work one morning, and it's like, you know, one something in the morning, thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing here? You know, at the end of everything, I, I don't think I'm going to look back on my life and go, damn it, I wish I spent another night in the office, or, you know, I wish I, uh, did that report a little better. They'll be signing up uh, athletes tomorrow for next year's race. They always talk about that cliche, second lease on life. Uh, it's honestly, it's there's a lot of truth to that. Okay, athletes, if you're getting done with your business, you need to move down to the red tier inflatable corral yourself in front of that. And by the way, you will be an Iron Man today. How's that? Iron Man. It's, it's always been a metaphor for me. People need to feel connected to something bigger than them for whatever reason. Warmer now? Much warmer. People want to feel like they're stronger than what others may believe or what they may believe. Nervous? Yeah, now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> me too. And probably more than anything, it taught me about what it means to be a strong man, a strong human being. If you go to an Iron Man, if you actually sit and watch an Iron Man, do you think they all look like these chiseled Greek gods? No. You guys paying a lot of money not to start at this point. Let's go! You see people of all shapes and sizes who are out there with whatever it is to prove 
in the same event as professional elite athletes. I owe a lot to the sport. I owe a lot to Iron Man because it gave me my life back. Don't move it. Don't move it. Yeah, I think I tore it again. Okay. I'm going to radio in and just make sure we've got someone coming to get you. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I, I did the very best. I did the best I could. Man. I did the very best I could, guys. That's no kidding. I did the best I could. I need that roller. I'm oh, so lucky you didn't die. How do you feel? I feel great. You look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right there, right there. That's the spot. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Yeah. Ah, that is fine. All right. Let's go run. I think it's worth doing Ironman for a lot of reasons, with cardiac patients in particular. Over an hour PR. It's a validation. I can do something most people can't do. 
I'm whole. You know? I'm whole. I can do this. Thank you. Can I get a hug too? Hey, buddy. Love you. Good Love job. Love you, too. Oh, All right. All right. Thank you. All right. So, and this might be hard to talk about, but do you think that Dave is preparing himself in some ways for leaving his kids behind? I mean, do you think that's what this is about in some way? Let me suggest this to you. Let me suggest that um, although he's very aware of his mortality, that he's not preparing to leave, he's preparing to live. Yours. And that he's doing what he has to do to drive forward what he believes in uh -oh. and what he wants his girls to see. More than preparing to leave, he's preparing to live. I'm sitting on the toilet, hog. <laughs> oh, sitting in the toilet. I had to put one hand yeah, on the too. sink and then one hand on the bathtub My and leg, try to lower no, myself. I've got no quads left. Either. I've got nothing. Drive. Ironman is not something you wake up one day and just decide to do. It's an incremental process, whether you have a heart condition or not. But that's part of what life is. Life is climbing that high mountain. Life is, is all about overcoming the odds that are against you. And probably 70 to 80% of it is mental. It is your mind that's going to get you to the finish line. You are the wind, the flood, and the flame. Nothing here can get in your way. You've come too far. They have to have a big heart to get this done because their heart throws out their passion. The heart gets their butt out of bed in the morning to go train. The heart is the one that's telling them, you know what, go that extra mile so race day's not as hard. And their heart is getting them to the finish line. Come on home, we're here for you. Let's go. Fly. How you guys doing? I'm all right. I just gotta remember what this feels like not finishing again. I'll figure this out sooner or later. Apparently, it's going to be later. But good part is I get a uh, pretty healthy lifestyle. Huh? So we got that going for it. Short term, I'm gonna get my knee fixed. Uh, long term, I'm signed up for Ironman Florida next year, so I'll be back in November doing this again. So. so when you think about everything you've been through, do you think there's value in that, in, in facing your own mortality? Without that happening to me, without having this life-changing event happening to me, I would never have taken the approach about embracing life to the same extent. So do I wish that this had never happened to me? No, I actually am glad it did because it gave me the reason to live. I think I'm one of the lucky ones because without it, you just take things for granted. Now I don't take anything for granted, not a single day.
My advice, you're a young person, you're an endurance athlete, get an EKG, see your doctor, just make sure. Just make sure, it'll take you an hour, it will cost you almost nothing. The cost of doing nothing could be huge. So look, check. Oh my God, you can stop right there.